Hello class, this is Dr. Branch. I trust that you're having a very good day. We're going to discuss seven major sources of economic progress. This is a brief review of my part on chapter two of Common Sense Economics. So why do, some of, why do the economies of some countries grow rapidly while others stagnate or even regress? Why are incomes per person so much higher in some countries than in others? These are the sort of questions we're trying to answer and the authors of your textbook are suggesting that these seven principles or seven key ideas which we're looking at here are essential and they, they provide the essential difference between economies that succeed and those that don't succeed on behalf of the populace. And the first issue is legal systems. And this really should be quite intuitive to you. Legal systems are the foundation for economic progress. It's a system that protects privately owned property and enforces contracts in an even-handed manner. And one of the problems you have in countries that have large and overflowing slums is there's actually no legal system within the slum itself other than maybe a gang or some group of violent thugs that kind of run the slum. And in some of these places around the world, the police don't even go into the slum, so there's no even legal protection of basic rights like freedom from assault or attack. But beyond that, it's very hard to buy and sell property in these slums because no one knows who owns the property. It's, it all gets very confusing. And basically, the big problem is there's no legal system that actually works in those, in those areas. So you have to have a legal system that protects private property. If there's no protection for me to own private property and then invest it and to use that property in such a way to produce a product, then I'm, if I can't be certain that it's going to be my property tomorrow because the legal system is so flawed, that really discourages me from investing in, in entrepreneurial decisions. And furthermore, contracts have to be enforced in an even-handed manner. What this means is you have a legal system that's free from the nasty practice of bribes where if I have a disagreement with someone, it's not really who's right or wrong. The question is, does that person offer a bigger bribe to the government official or judge than I do? So you have to have a legal system above everything else. This should make good sense to you from Romans 13, that we uh, verses 1 through 7. Government is established by man to, excuse me, government is established by God to keep man from exploiting each other because of our sinful nature. The three essential elements of private property ownership are right to exclusive use, legal protection against invaders, and the right to transfer the property to another person, especially this issue of exclusive use. For example, I have a 2001 Toyota 4Runner, and it is my personal property. I have the right to own that as, uh, as no one else does for my own personal use. If I did not have that right, that means anyone could come up to me and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to take your car right now and use it, even though it's technically yours. If I lose the right to exclusive use, I really don't have ownership. What does the Bible say about private property? Well, first of all, God is the king of the universe, and he owns everything. He's sovereign. Uh, Psalm 50 says this, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and everything in it is mine. For the earth is the Lord and all that is in it, is what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says. Ownership of property is regarded as a stewardship to be governed by the word of God. Here we're dealing with the mandate from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, and 28, where we are to rule the earth and subdue it, not exploit the earth, but we are to have dominion over it. And so part of that is stewardship of the property we own. And possession of property is a way for the godly to fulfill their dominion assignment under God. The commandments, thou shalt not steal and you shall not covet, are meaningless unless there are prior owners responsible to God. Karl Marx hated private property. Marx and Engels declared in the Communist Manifesto that the right to hold individual private property was a crime against the state. I will say quickly, they tried to discern between personal property and private property. For Marx and Engels, personal property was something like your coat or your belt or your shoes or something like that, and you have a right to own that. But what they denied was that people had the right to private ownership of the means of production. And so that means farmers shouldn't own their land and you shouldn't own a business that produces lawnmowers or, 
or CDs or MP play, MP3 plays or anything else. Those should all be owned by the state. And the first commandment of communism called for the op, ab, abolition of property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. And their third commandment ab, abolished all right of inheritance. I have no right to bequeath my 26 acres in Alabama to my daughters, according to Karl Marx, or the state to own all those things. This is a quote from the Communist Manifesto, Chapter 2, in English. Quote, the theory of the communist may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. Now, closely related to his disdain for, for private property, this was closely tied to his great enemies, Marx, I mean, were the biblical God and the family. He saw these as linked together as the great champions of private property. And private ownership of property for Marx and Engels was the cornerstone of the family and the family the key institution of biblical religion. To abolish private ownership of property, Christianity had to be attacked as well as the family. So his attacks against God and his atheism was almost kind of a pragmatic atheism because if he got rid of God, he could accomplish the goals he wanted. Attacks on private ownership are also attacks on the family. I, I want to stress this, that Marxism hates the family. He wanted to destroy the family's independence and instead wanted it to be dependent on the state. He did not want people to trust that, hey, I'm farming this land, my father's going to bequeath it to me, and that's how I'm going to take my care of myself after dad dies. No, he wanted the state to own all that. And the real goal here was he wanted the state to take the place of the father and mother as the provider. Just to give you an insight into this, there's echoes of this in our own nation. As of 2016, the federal government has a top tax rate of 40% on estates after exclusions. They allow about $5 million in exclusions, but after that, there's a 40% tax. That means the government's taking almost half of someone has spent their entire life building, but instead of saying you can pass it on to your children, the United States federal government says, no, we're going to take almost half of that. And what I would stress to you is that liberals today want that rate to go even higher. So, uh, several incentives associated with private ownership rights. First, it encourages wise stewardship. If I own it, then I'm going to be really motivated to take good care of it, usually. Now, a good example of what happens when people don't own things is Cabrini Green in Chicago. This, this whole complex that you're looking at here mercifully has been torn down, but it was a case study and public housing gone bad. It was run by gangs and drugs. It, it was just a complete... Uh, hell on earth, really, in so many ways. And what happened was the people did not own the property and yet no desire or really no motivation to take good care and manage the property, and it just did not work out. And this has been multiplied several times across the United States. It encourages people to use their property productively. Uh, this is an interesting example of your book. In the Soviet Union, after they collectivized all the land and the state took it over, they allowed certain families to keep one-acre plots on which to grow their own food and something they might sell, almost like a truck farm. You've seen these little things around cities where people bring in their homegrown tomatoes and things to sell. Well, even though these small plots accounted for only 2% of the total land in cultivation during the Soviet Union, they provided 25% of the total value of the Soviet agricultural output. They, they disproportionately provided more food. Why? Because when you don't own the land, you're not motivated to manage it properly. But when you do own it, you are motivated to manage it as a resource that can continue to reproduce and is sustainable over long periods of time. Uh, another incentive is private owners have a strong incentive to develop things that they own in ways that are beneficial to others. This goes back to the textbook's emphasis on free markets. And so if, if I develop something that is beneficial to you, you want to buy it, you get a derived benefit, I earn a profit. It's a win-win deal. We're back to the zero-sum myth that is associated with capitalism. If owners develop their property in ways that others find attractive, the market value of the property will increase. This just... For example, if someone has a piece of land that's a rundown strip mall and they buy it, tear down the strip mall and replace it with something lovely and attractive, other people want to be around there. It raises the property value of everyone in the community. And it promotes the wise development and conservation of resources for the future. If I want to pass something on to my kids, I want to manage it well today so it's still there for them in the future. Here's what I want you to know. 
Societies that promote private ownership have a far better track record in environmental management than countries which do not do so. Now, that doesn't mean they're perfect. We talked about the dangers of bad things like hydraulic mining and things during, during the 1800s. But I'm saying as the trajectory, the trajectory is much better. Here in the United States, this is a wonderful diagram showing you the, uh, the percentage of each state that's owned by the federal government. And part of the challenge we're facing now is, especially in the West, large swaths of land are owned by the federal government. And these have many resources on them, things like trees and lumber, uh, coal, oil, all these sort of things that are there. Well, how do you manage this land in such a way that you can derive the benefit from the resources that are there without destroying the, the environment. Some people's answer is just don't do anything with it, but that doesn't seem to be a good management of the land to me. So anyway, that's just sort of the question we're looking at. But this is uh, the Aral Sea. This is an inland sea in the former Soviet Union. And I want you to look at the difference between 1989 and 2014, and it had already shrunk considerably in 1989. What you're looking at is the Soviets cut off all the water going to the Aral Sea. It's nothing but salt flats now. It's horrible. This used to be a sea that teemed with fish and people could derive resources from it. And it, it, it really helped that area and that region of the world. Now it's just almost completely gone because of the Soviets' poor management of water going into it. There's a lot more I'd like to say, but I'm going to scoot past some of these. Um, I would point this out to you. Very quickly, when you have competitive markets, there's gradually going to be an, uh, an improvement in the type of products that people get. Look at the trajectory from a gramophone to a record player to an 8-track to cassette tapes to CDs all the way now to MP3 players. And this happens because of competitive markets. Uh, let me just say this about government's role. The Bible makes it very clear, 1 Peter chapter 2, that we have to have government. And it has a role. It says they are sent here by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do good. So government exists in order to provide order in the place of chaos. We as Christians are not anarchists. I'm not a libertarian even, but uh, we're, we're not anarchists. Governments exist to restrain evil. That's the main goal. Man is a sinner, so God has established government to reign in the sinful nature of man. And then government exists to promote good. Those are the three basic functions of government. But when government gets in the way with its bureaucracy, look at this. This is from your textbook. Fascinating. In Peru, it took 289 days to open a small business. In Singapore, it only took four days. So you see how the government bureaucracy here restrains the entrepreneurial initiative. It's, it's punishing initiative. If you can make an analogy to church life, if you've ever tried to do anything in a church and they wanted you to meet with five different committees and it took you six months just to plan a simple outreach event, then you understand the frustration of people in Peru as opposed to uh, Singapore. So let me just say a few other things before I move on. And uh, monetary stability, a stable monetary policy is essential for the control of inflation. If money does not have stable, predictable value, it will be difficult for borrowers and lenders to find mutually agreeable terms for a loan. What they're dealing with here is hyperinflation that takes place in countries that do not manage their monetary value in a good way. So inflation is, is bad news for economic progress. Low tax rates actually encourage growth. People are, will produce more when they are permitted to keep more of what they earn. Uh, when high tax rates take a large share of income, the incentive to work and use resources productively declines. I strongly agree with the textbook here. There's a lot of discussion today about the rich paying their fair share. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, if you're one of the wealthiest people in the United States, you are, you're already paying over 40% in your tax rate. So people talk about the wealthy paying their fair share. Well, they're already paying their fair share. I think taking 40% of someone's income is, is eminently fair. Um, I cannot stress enough high tax rates discourage work effort and reduce the productivity of labor. If you go back to this chart right here, there was a time several years ago when Lisa and I were halfway between here and here. And when we moved up from this tax rate right here, we both got raises and we moved up into this tax bracket right here. Even though we earned more money in the ensuing year, we actually brought home less money because the government was taking 10% more. 
So it was very discouraging to earn that next $100 that sent us from 74.8 to 74.9. Why? Because we're now paying a lot more taxes. So people start looking for tax shelters and high marginal tax rates encourage individuals to consume tax deductible goods instead of non deductible goods. You start looking for things you don't really need. Uh, all that said, I'm not a Bernie Sanders fan. Uh, he's arguing for some sort of 90% tax rate. That's just insane. That's going to kill business. The last thing I'll say is about free trade. Your book is a strong advocate for free trade. I just have a few concerns that I would bring out. First of all, what about sweatshops? The book doesn't really seem to address the sometimes ex exploitation of laborers in some third world nations. And then with labor being paid less than their fair wages in these poorer nations, Wealth is still accumulated by the richer nations. It seems to me at some level there does seem to be a wealth transfer going on. And, and I would also say is, is free trade a form of mercantilism? And the last thing I would say, I don't have it here, but I would just ask, are free trade markets always redemptive? And I don't think they are. So we, we have to be real careful. You need government in order to restrain some of the nasty exploitation of people that can take place at times in free markets. I hope this has been helpful for you as you review this chapter of uh, Basic Economic Progress.